Hello again everyone. Today I'll be doing another coaching session. This coaching session will be for someone named High Noon Twist. Rather than going over my constructed theorem macro tips, firstly I will be going over the particular micro specifics about the champion being coached, which is Xin Zhao. I'll firstly go over the skill build of the summoner. His skill build is to be chosen as Q first, leveling, then W, then E, followed by maxing Q, then, then W, and then followed by E. However, what I recommend and what I have obtained from a challenger player on the site op.gg is instead this skill build. I do not play Zinzal myself, however, this is from a challenger player and so it is much more correct than this skill build. This skill build here recommends that you start E first, followed by Q, then W, which is, which is quite different from this skill build which the summoner High Noon Twist uses. So instead, you should follow this skill build order where you max W first instead of maxing your Q first, followed by your W. I will now go over the benefits of maxing in this skill order. Even though I do not play the champion Xin Zhao, I have done some research on his abilities and I can give some valid information on the reason why you would, instead of maxing Q first, you instead max your W first. So, just to make sure you are aware of what I am saying, you should follow this build, this skill build, and not the skill build that you have already chosen. So you need to change your skill build maxing order. This will greatly benefit you in each game playing Xin Zhao. And so you need to take this information into each game. I'll briefly go over the reasoning for maxing W first instead of maxing your Q first. So these skills are in order. Your Q is the second one here, W, W after, then E, and firstly has the passive. I'll read the passive firstly. It says, Xin Zhao on every third basic attack or when he uses uh, wind becomes lightning, which is his W, which is the skill that they suggest to max first, your W. It says, when this skill, which is your W strike, strikes, it deals that damage and restores a certain amount of HP. So whenever you use a third basic attack or you use the W, uh, it deals this damage and it restores your health. Being able to sustain in the jungle, what I mean by sustain is to keep your HP high, is very beneficial as if you have a higher HP pool, you're able to clear more camps. Not only that, but you're able to do more ganks and stay on the map for a longer period of time before having to go to base. So, what the W reads is, the first deals physical damage to all enemies in an arc and the second deals physical damage in a line, slowing all enemies hit by 50% for 1.5 seconds. Both strikes deal 50% damage against minions, benefit from blah, 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 and the duration of his other abilities is paused during the effect. Basically, what all this means is that you are able to provide a slow onto the camp that you are clearing. And when you're providing this slow onto the camp, it therefore decreases the speed at which it can do damage to you and basically CCing your camp. And so this is beneficial when you are clearing any jungle. This is probably the most likely reason why most challenger players max W first over Q, which says it simply dashes to a target enemy, and then if Zinzar is within attack range of his target, he instead skews his target with his glaive. Then gets bonus attack speed for 5 seconds. This could be beneficial, however, the reason why they max W first is so that you're able to sustain better in the jungle. That is the main reason. So you should max the W first because of this. That is the basis of the skill build explanation and why you should take this build over the build that you are currently taking in the first image. So you need to change your skill build order firstly. I'll next go into your runes. The runes that you have opted to choose is taking domination as your primary tree and precision as your secondary tree. These runes are fine in the sense of the individual runes. However, it is better that you take these runes, which are also from a challenger player on the site op.gg, where instead of taking precision as your secondary rune page, you should instead take precision as your primary rune page and domination as your secondary rune page. 
The reason is for, for this is mostly because um, Zinzao is able to get deep into a fight and is able to apply um, press the attack, which enables not only you, but all enemies, all allies, attacking this enemy to deal bonus damage. And this is more beneficial to the fact that Zinzao can get in close range and do his damage. This, this is able to scale way better into the late game than um, taking Electrocute can scale into the late game. And therefore, it is better to take these runes over the current runes you are taking. It has much larger benefits by taking this rune page. And so you need to change your runes in addition to changing your skill build order. Those are the first two things I need to mention. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about the item build. The item build you opt for is taking um, Warrior Enchantment, which is fine. Taking Tabai's Boots. And then taking Phantom Dancer. An armor penetration item like Dor Dominic's regard, and then taking Thorn Nail. I do not suggest taking this item build. Instead, I suggest you take this item build, which is also from a challenger player, just to increase the validity of this statement, where they take Warrior Enchantment just like how you are, then they take Trinity Force in order to deal much more damage than you're able to deal by taking Phantom Dancer, which is a, a critical chance item. And Zinsaw doesn't really benefit from critical chance near as much as other champions, such as Yasa or Trindamir. Since his primary damage is not from his auto attacks, it's more from his skills over um, that. And so instead of taking Phantom Dancer, I do not recommend ever taking Phantom Dancer when you're playing Zinsaw. Instead, you should build Trinity Force as your second item. And then, instead of building Lord Dominic's Regard, which is the red item you have here, or rather, alternative to it, which is an armor penetration item. Instead, you should be building Black Cleaver, which is this third item I've mentioned here. Black Cleaver basically does a similar thing to Lord Dominic's regard, but instead of doing this alone of adding bonus armor penetration onto tanks, it instead also gives you a larger health pool, and that is what a champion like Zinzao, which is an engaged bruiser type champion, wants over just taking armor penetration. This item of armor penetration, like Lord Dominic's regard, the red item you have in your build, is mostly only for ADCs, because ADCs benefit mostly from this. They don't need a large tank, large tanky health pool, and so they wouldn't benefit as much from Black Cleaver. So Black Cleaver basically takes over the role of Lord Dominic's regard, and so it's better to take Black Cleaver over this item you have inside your item build. So you should take this challenger item build over the item build you have. A reason why I suggest you do not take tab eyes. You can take tab eyes. However, it is situational. If the enemy team has a large amount of champions who auto attack, uh, therefore it will be very useful to take tab eyes. However, if you, let's say, you're against an enemy team that has a large amount of slows that can slow you down, it is better to take um what I call it the... Movement speed boots, not mobile, not mobile boots, but instead the white boots, because you're able to take less slows and be able to engage without being um crowd controlled as much. Instead of taking um those mobility boots, you can I mean you can also take mobility boots, which is mobiles. By taking mobility boots, this is most beneficial when you have a lead on the enemies. Let's say you're able to get two kills in the early game, or maybe or maybe even three kills. Anything can happen. So, let's say you were to get a lead in the early game, then you will be able to apply this lead to other areas of the map more quickly if you have Moby Boots, which is the yellow and brown boots. These boots are able to allow you to um, snowball your lead greater since you can be on, on areas of the map that the enemy aren't able to get to as quickly since Moby Boots give you a large amount of mobility and speed. And given that the enemy has a large amount of magic damage, then it is better to get Merc Mercury Threads boots, which is the blue boots. So it's all situational depending on which boots you get. But I think in this game, there is not a large amount of auto attackers in comparison. The only auto attacker on the enemy team in this replay analysis is Jinx. Nasus auto attacks every now and then, and so does Zack. But in comparison to a team, let's say, that had Jinx, maybe another AD carry or a Bruiser top that auto attacks a lot, um, let's say like probably Olaf or any auto attacker, then you use better to get tab eyes. In this game, I would suggest you get either Mercury Threads for Katrina since she's extremely ahead as you can see in this um, match history, or instead of getting Mercury Threads, you could have gotten the movement speed boots, the white boots, in order to take less 
crowd control onto you due to the fact that Zach has a large amount of crowd control. So does um, Thresh and so does Nasus. So it's all situational. After you build these three items, which is the items I suggest you build on Zen Zhao, instead of the item build you have, is you then build a tank item. You chose to build Thornhill in this game. However, Thornhill isn't very beneficial in this game, particularly because of the fact that they only have one main auto attacker, which is Jinx, and Thornhill reflects auto attack damage. So it's not great to get Thornhill in this specific game. If they had more auto attackers, champions that mainly get their damage from auto attacks, like let's say a Trindamir, Yasuo, etc., then you could have gotten um, Thornmail. However, in this specific game, I would have suggested instead of getting Thornmail, you could have gotten Adaptive Helm, because the most damage from Katarina, particularly by her build, is coming from magic damage. Not only Katarina, but it's also Zack who does a large amount of magic damage. And so it is better you had got uh, Adaptive Helm, Either Adaptive Helm or Abyssal Mask. Either one would have benefited you greatly. You could have also gotten, uh, probably as a tank item, probably Warmogs or either Warmogs or Deadman's Plates. Both would benefit you, but Thormir wouldn't really benefit you as significantly in this specific game because there aren't so many auto attackers. So, in my opinion, in this particular game, you should have gotten, um, Adaptive Helm, after you got Adaptive Helm, you could have gotten Warmogs. Or you could have gotten both Adaptive Helm and Abyssal Mask, inclusive of Warmogs. Warmogs gives you a large amount of health, and so therefore it buffs your champion. In addition to these items I have listed, I also explain each item when you would want to get it. You would want to get Thornmail when the enemy team has at least two auto-attack based champions. In this game, there's only one main auto-attack based champion, which is Jinx. Uh, let's say the enemy team had a large amount of damage, which is reoccurrent AP damage, which is large amounts of AP continuously, which is in this case being given by Katarina, then you can get Adaptive Helm, or even both Adaptive Helm and Abyssal Mask, given that the enemy team has a large amount of AP damage. In this game, they do have a significant amount of the AP damage coming from both Zack and Katarina. So you can get both. Uh, let's say your team had a healer, then you could have also gotten... Spirit Visage, what I mean by a healer is you could have had like a Soraka on your team, or you could have had a Sona, or any champion that can heal you, then it would have been beneficial to get Spirit Visage, because what Spirit Visage does, which is a green item here, the Spirit Visage applies magic resist, which will help you in being tanky for Katarina and Zack, but not only this, it also would allow you to heal more from the healing done by your support, which could have been Soraka, or not only Soraka, but it could also be Sona, or even your champion itself, Zin Zhao, heals a lot, but it would be more beneficial if your team had a healer support. So, in addition to this, you could have gotten Dead Man's Plate if the enemy team has an AD, a lots of, lots of AD damage. They have a mixture of AP and AD damage. You have Jinx and you have it's called Nasus. Therefore, you would benefit from taking Dead Man's Plate in this game. If when you want to take Randuins is when the enemy team has a large amount of critical damage. Randuins is a yellow item here. The Randuins will benefit where the enemy team has large amounts of crit chance. Let's say the enemy team had a Trindamere or Yasuo. Or let's say they had... Even in this game, it might be okay to build Randuins for Jinx. It's all situational. You could have built either Dead Man's Plate or Randuins. Both would be beneficial. So it's your choice, but Randuins is mostly the enemy team has large amounts of crit chance. Let's say in addition to Jinx, they also had a Trindamere, or they had another ADC who builds large amounts of crit chance, like maybe a Vayne, or if they had a Yasuo. All these crit high critical chance champions, in addition to maybe Gangplank. Gangplank also builds high on critical chance. And therefore, Randwins would be very beneficial in those instances. When you want to build Frozen Heart, is when the enemy team, which is the blue item near the end, is when the enemy team has large amounts of attack speed champions. What I mean by attack speed champions, champions like ADCs, like let's say Jinx in, a, in this situation, but there's only one ADC, one auto main auto attacking champion. So you don't really want to build Frozen Heart in this situation. However, let's say the enemy team also had a Trindamere, Yasuo, any champion that auto attacks very frequently. It could even be, let's say, 
a another ADC on, on the enemy team. It all depends on the enemy team composition. If they had large amounts of attack speed based champions, champions that auto attack very quickly, then you would want to build the blue item, which is Frozen Heart. Lastly, when you want to build War Morgs, which is just to give you more HP, is when, let's say, the enemy team has a mixture of AP and AD, like in this game, where you just want to bulk up on health because you don't want to build a strictly AD item, like, let's say, Dead Man's Plate or Thornmail, then War Morgs is very good because it gives you more health and therefore benefits for both AP and AD champions. All the tank items are situational. However, in totality, you mainly want to strictly build these items for Zin Zhao firstly, which is the three items, War Enchantment, Triforce, and then Black Cleaver, and then you can finish off by building these tank items depending on what the enemy team has based on what I just explained. Okay, so firstly, before I get into the replay itself, I want to explain what I mean by macro tips. Macro tips is the term I have constructed, which basically applies to the decision making you make in each game, the game knowledge you make, game knowledge you apply to each game based on all champions and the team compositions and your thinking of how you win this game or rather the win conditions. It is all about the general scheme of the game, when to take objectives, etc. Like Dragon, Repairer, Baron, Towers. It is all about knowing the overall game rather than just knowing what is known as micro. Micro is when you're talking about just the mechanical scheme of each champion based on how they can maneuver the champion using their abilities to gain a benefit. So Macro Tips is the theorem I've constructed where I will be placed in a numbered form explaining where you can improve in each element of your game, where this applies to not only one game in particular, like in this replay analysis, but instead it applies to all games. What I'm applying to all games is you can take the same numbered macro tips into another game and you can gain benefits in each game you play. It's not strictly to one particular game. So I'm now going to go over the first macro tip before I get into the replay analysis itself. I say that you should stay to playing only your two best jungle champions in order to prevent yourself from losing knowledge on those champions as well as the game on a whole. When you're playing ranked and you want to climb or rather improve, in order to best improve your macro, which is the decision making aspect of the game, you should stay to only champions you know very well and you're able to gain a good win rate on them. Not only that, but you feel good on the champion and you're able to improve your own play. You don't want to larger on your pool of champions or rather your extent of champions like maybe like five champions you don't want to play so many champions you want to strictly limit your champion pool so you're able to focus on the game aspects rather than focusing on each champion individually so i would say you avoid playing kazix i see you playing kazix but i say you should avoid playing kazix and jabon reason why i say you should stop or rather only limit your pool to Warwick and Xin Zhao is due to the reason I mentioned and this is mainly if you really want to improve in ranked. So only play two jungle champions. If you're playing support, similarly only play two support characters. I see you play Sona, so stay to those champions alone. You should, macro tip number two states you should always perform a pre-game analysis prior to the start of the game in order to know your pathing as well as your and the enemy's win conditions. Win condition states how you win a particular game in both your side of the team and the enemy's team. So based on looking at this image, which states the enemy team composition and your team composition, in order to win this game, you need to snowball the early game. The reason why I say you should snowball the early game is because the enemy team has a stronger team composition, which relates to how they will win team fights. They have Zack who can engage very well and is not only a good engager but is also very tanky. They have Nasus who scales infinitely into the late game. They have Katarina who is able to do a large amount of AoE damage once you are in the circle of her ult. Then they have Jinx who can be the backline and do damage as well consistently while you all are crowd controlled from Zack. E or even Thresh who can hook someone and crowd control more and more of your team. And so their team composition is very good into a team fight playstyle. While your team 
is more of a needing to snowball the early game. What I mean by snowball is you need to take as many towers as you possibly can in the early stages of the game. Once you're able to take many towers in the early stages of the game, you're able to deny the enemy from reaching the late game. The late game phase is what the enemy team wants. Because their team fight is better and they scale better than your team, they'll be able to snowball or rather win team fights. And therefore, once it reaches to the late game, which is around 30 to 40 minutes or later than that, then the enemy team is most likely going to win the game because their team composition is just too good for the late game. Uh, what you all need to do in addition to snowballing the lanes itself in terms of the turrets and getting objectives like um, Repairal or even Dragon, not only this, but your goal should be in this game is to go onto the Katarina or and the Jinx. And you need to kill these carries as these carries will be doing the most amount of damage in the game. The most amount of damage will not be coming from Zack, Nasus or Thresh. They will just be the front line to try and deny you from doing damage to their carries, which is Katarina and Jinx. So you need to get onto the back line, which is Katarina and Jinx, and you need to kill them when the fight starts, or rather before the fight even starts. So your team will be at an advantage, and then you'll be able to win team fights. It's only in that situation when you can win a team fight. When you're trying to do a 5v5, it is going to be very difficult in the late stages of the game to win a team fight. The only times you'll be able to win a team fight is in the early game. And so you need to analyze each game prior to the start of it. I'll now go into the replay itself and I will discuss the remainder amount of macro tips. I've, I have wrote down 20 different macro tips. These macro tips will assist you in winning the game in this particular game and also all future games. At the end of this replay analysis, I will discuss the positives. The positives relates to what you have done correctly in this game and what I will commend you on, but what you need to continue working on, and you need to apply these same positives to each game. You cannot, you cannot let yourself forget what you have already done well, as you need to keep applying not only these positives I have mentioned, but also the macro tips I am going to state in this specific replay analysis. So I will start off the replay analysis by looking at the third macro tip. So you're starting at red buff. Hell yeah, red buff is fine. Because you're getting a leash from your bot side and bot side gives the best leash. In this situation, I see that Tristana is AFK in the early stages of the game. So you don't get as good of a leash as you could have possibly got. But if Tristana was there, you would be very healthy on your first camp. Just waiting for your red buff to spawn at the moment. This is where my, my third macro tip comes into play. I see you walking back and forth into the red buff camp. This cancels some of the auto attacks of the red buff and allows you to take less damage. The only thing I would say you do you should do better here is probably pull back the red buff a little more to, and pull it towards your camp here, more towards the bush. Therefore, if you're able to pull it to this side, you're able to increase the speed of your clear because you're, you're moving in the direction that you need to move next, which is up to your blue buff. But you cleared the camp pretty well by moving back and forth, which is known as kiting. And if you're taking less damage and it will be higher on HP than, let's say, the enemy if they weren't to kite the camp. So this is mentioned here. You should always... I see you kite the red buff. However, I realized... In the later stages of the game, you do not end up kiting all the buffs. <clears throat> so I say you should always kite every jungle camp in the early game where possible to get an advantage where it concerns HP. So you'll be high on HP. Because you're high on HP, you can clear more camps before you have to back. Not only that, but you're able to do more ganks and you're able to be on the map for a longer period before you have to go back to base. This is a beneficial macro tip. This should be applied to all games. I will now continue the replay. So you're walking towards the bot side river in order to invade Zack. This is fine. However, this is fine. You're taking blue buff, which isn't a problem. However, I realize after you finish clearing blue buff, instead of going um, to clear the scuttle crab, which is in your river, you instead 
walk away and you go towards your blue side in order to continue clearing your wolf camp and then your blue buff. Instead, what you should have done is you should have stopped right here and cleared Scuffle Crab. The reason why you should clear Scuffle Crab is because you want to deny vision from the enemy as best as you possibly can. In this situation, the, the particular Scuffle Crab might not be so useful for your bottom lane. However, it is very useful for your mid lane if Zack was to walk down to the river then the enemy the uh, your ally mid talon would be able to see him coming before he actually does the gank this is very beneficial you should have cleared the scuttle crab here not only clear the scuttle crab but you should have also walked down the river and tried to see if you could have got a successful gank on bot lane i realize you're level two however because you are level two instead what you could have done is after you cleared blue buff you could have went and cleared gromp as well because Zack wasn't at blue buff, it is most likely that he is still on red side and he's not going to pop down to his grump at a sufficient speed. Zack's clears aren't that fast in comparison to a champion like Xin Zhao, and so you have the ability to clear blue buff and then grump without getting contested from Zack. Not only this, you then clear Scuttle Crab. By that time, you would be level 3. You can see your experience bar, which is the purple bar. This purple bar rec shows how long you need to reach to level 3. Once you get to level 3, you'll have your 3 abilities, which is all you need to gank. Then, after you cleared Grom, Blue Buff, and Scuttle Crab, you could have walked down using the speed boost from the Scuttle Crab and tried to get a successful gank on bot side. I cannot see bot side to see how low on HP they are. However, if your bot side was on higher HP, even if they are like mid HP, then you can easily gank that bot side. Because you have a Lux who can also help you to get some damage onto them and both not only damage them but also crowd control them. This would be beneficial. So you should walk down your river and you should check to see if you could have got a successful gank here. This would very easily snowball the game. You can get a lead on kills, not only kills, but you're also going to get a lead on experience. And you're going to put your bot side ahead, but not only put your bot side ahead, but also put the bottom enemy lane also behind. I cannot see the HP levels of your team, however, it is most likely you could have done this gank if you took Gromp as well as Blue Earth and the Scuttle Crab to get level 3. So you always need to consider gank opportunities where possible. You cannot gank mid in this situation, you can easily gank bot side because they are so pushed up. So you need to consider always getting a gank where you can, instead of walking all the way back to your side of the jungle. This can be very beneficial for you. Not only that, but you could have, instead of just going down, which I've suggested from Scuttle Crab after clearing the Grump and Blue Buff, you could have gone back to your jungle and got level 3 from maybe the Raptor Camp or Golems, and then you could have parted down through the Tribush bot side, and then you could have got a successful gank most likely. So you need to always think of gank opportunities that could work. So I mentioned here, always kill Scuttle Crab if you are near the area and is uncontested by the enemy jungler. This is macro tip number 4. This will provide vision for your laners, thus diminishing the chance for successful enemy gank. But as I mentioned previously, not only for successful enemy gank, but also it denies vision from the enemy. So the enemy cannot clear that and cannot use it to assist them in knowing where you are when you want to get a successful gank off, or knowing where Talon is, which is your mid laner, when he decides to roam down to try and help bot. So this is all valid information that you should take into account. Fifth macro tip says you should always look for ganking opportunities over farming your jungle to obtain a lead for your team. This is what I mentioned here as your fifth macro tip and is what I've stated previously by you cannot just walk down bot and try to get a gank off. Though I cannot see the HP levels so it isn't 100% positive it could have worked. But it's something you need to consider. I'll now continue the replay and state the sixth macro tip when it reaches that point. This is what I meant by you could have kited the camp. You're not kiting the wolf camp, but you could have kited the wolf camp. Could have walked back and forth in order to deny damage being taken onto your champion. And this will keep you healthier. You don't take so much damage due to the fact that Zinzo has a very healthy kit by nature of his skills that heal him. Or you could have <clears throat> cleared it maybe faster and you could have also taken less damage. If it was another champion, let's say not Zinzo or Warwick, this could have been 
a crucial thing to take less damage there. Even for Zinza, it's beneficial. Like, you should always kite your camps. I see you kiting your camp here. You're walking back and forth with blue buff. I'm just emphasizing it that you need to do it on each camp, which is good. So you need to continue kiting your camps like you're doing here. And this will greatly benefit you for all games if you continue doing this. This is mentioned in the end of the pulp. In the end of the word documents, where I say your kiting on your initial red buff is good, but it must be applied to all jungle camps in the early game. This is a good trait that you have picked up, and you need to continue it for all games, and it will greatly benefit you, as you'll be more healthy in the jungle, and therefore you'll be able to extend your lead to other sides of the map. Credit vision plan, that's fine. You want to know where Zach is. You haven't really seen him on the map too much yet, besides mid lane, I think, when he tried to get a gank on Talon. Playing Scuttlecraft, this is good. This is what I had mentioned he should have done earlier. Right now, you're parting towards top lane for some reason. You don't have. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, as I was saying, you're parting towards top lane. There's no real reason for you to part towards top lane here because you see that Olaf has already Olaf has already died, already went back to base. And so you're parted up to try and seems to get a gank. But there's no real reason for you to try and part up here. Where you are on the map. Uh, Nasus isn't able to see you on the map because of the fact of Fog of War, which disables enemies from seeing you based on the placement of your minions. However, if Nasus was a slightly more up in the lane, then you'll be able to see you back in there. And if this was a higher ELO game, is only this is silver in this particular game. However, th if this was a higher ELO game, maybe even gold or platinum, then the enemy will know where you are if you are up on top and visible in the lane and you don't want to so you don't want to ever go into a lane when there's no gank opportunity because Olaf is back you want to always back in an area that is not visible from the enemy team at all there's a possibility that Nasus could have seen you if he had placed a ward in that bush um, where you walked through earlier in addition to the fact that if he was more pushed up in the lane he could have seen you and therefore the enemy jungler could have used this to his advantage and he could have checked to see if you had any camps in your jungle, if he could have cleared any. Like, let's say he could have walked towards Golems and your bot side jungle. And because you're backing and you have to go back to base and buy items, there's a likelihood you wouldn't reach there in time and you'll be able to take your camp. You don't want to ever show yourself on the map or rather waste time by walking towards the lane. Instead, you should have backed in a location further away from top lane and you'll be able to waste less time. You may say that this isn't such an uh, important thing, however, it all adds up. Everything is about time efficiency and not wasting time on a whole. So, as I say here, never waste time walking to a lane. This is marketing number six. When there are no gangs possible, as efficiency is very important for a jungler. This is exactly what I've talked about previously. I will now continue watching the replay. So you're clearing your raptors. Clearing your raptors is fine here. However, I would have suggested instead you went to your golems first, which is your um, bottom camp. Uh, if you took golems, then you could have walked up to clear your, your mm -hmm. raptors. The reason why I say this is you want to clear your camps in an efficient pattern. But I, when you clear your camps in an efficient pattern, your camps will spawn at correct times and you're clearing all your camps. So you wouldn't be missing a camp by not clearing golems. So you need to clear golems. And you need to clear all your camps. You can't put a higher priority over a specific camp. So you need to clear your camps sequentially. And you need to clear them all. So you're clearing your raptors, which is fine. Then you go to try and get a gank off in mid, which is also fine. Because this is, and as you can see, Katarina already used a gap close. I'm not sure if you acknowledge the fact that she used a gap close. But it is very difficult for her to get away because of the fact that she used her gap close and to try and do some damage on her. Talon, excuse me, and because of this, you can easily get this gank off because she already went in and used her main escape ability. This is the only other ability she has to escape, but it's very easy to get a kill on that. After you get this kill, 
you want to push in the lane. You don't want to take the lane as yes. That's the, that is one thing you don't want to do. I see you mentioned this in the comments on Daniel's group. You don't want to take the CS. The reason why you don't want to take the CS is because you're putting your laner at a disadvantage by him having less CS when you take CS from the lane. Instead, what you want to do is you want to, as best as possible, not take CS, but as well as push in the wave. You want to push in the wave, which is the enemy wave, so that your minion wave is able to crash into the enemy tower. By crashing the enemy minion wave, your ally minion wave into the tower, the enemy Lena, who is dead, which in this case is Katarina, is unable to take the minions that have died to the tower. Not only this, but you, she is also missing out on not only ex, not only um, CS, which gives her goal lead, but also experience. Experience is very important as a Lena and as any champion in League of Legends. So you want to deny them as much goal and experience as you possibly can. So you always want to push in the wave or assist Talon in pushing in the wave after you've got a kill. This applies to all lanes. You don't want to only apply this to mid lane when this in this particular game. You want to always push in the wave after you've done clear killing an uh, enemy champion. So that you can crash into the tower and deny them experience and gold. I mentioned this here. Always help your laner push the ally wave into the enemy tower without taking minions. After a successful gun kill, as doing this starves the enemy laner of both minions as well as experience and thus puts them behind while putting your laner ahead. Talon has some, has some decent wave clear, however, he isn't able to push in the wave to a, a quick enough extent for him to be able to back. Not only this what I've noted, but he's also able to back more quickly. And because he's able to back more quickly if your system, he's able to buy his items more quickly and arrive in the lane to catch the next minion wave much more quickly than if he was to clear the, camp, clear the wave by himself. So you always need to assist your laners. This is actually a very important macro tip, which I mentioned as macro tip number 7. I will now continue the replay as, and allocate the 8th macro tip, which I mentioned here. You're trying to get vision on Zack, which is fine. Zack is in mid lane, but there's no way for him to get a kill or a gank off because of the fact that Katrina is in the lane yet. You clear Scuttle Crab, which is fine. You end up parting bound bot side to see if you can get a gank. However, <clears throat> what I want to mention here, which is in macro tip number 8, is there's absolutely no point in you parting down here to try and get a successful gank off. Reason why there's no chance of you getting a successful gank off here is because of the fact that your laners are pushing the minion wave into the enemy tower. And the enemy laners are very near to the tower and very far from you being able to damage them. And so they are not being going to be able to push up the wave quick enough for your laners to be able to be more pushed into their tower for you to be able to gank the lane itself. Because they are so far away from the center of the lane, there's no way for you to get a gank off here. Not only this, but you have as your laners, you have Lux and Tristana. Lux and Tristana have way more wave clear than does Jinx and Thresh. So it is likely that the majority of the game they are going to be pushed up, but in this particular instance, there's no chance for you to get a successful kill. Zack ends up pathing down. However, this is a very variable variable thing because I am almost positive that you were did not account for Zack pathing down here because you did not see him on the map besides me yeah you did not see him on the map you had no wards so there's no way you could have known that zach was parting down here it's very unlikely you most likely went for this kill because of the fact that the laners were there but it is not possible to get a gank off in this situation not only this but your laner tristan is very low on hp now so you want to back off from this gank because the ability to be able to get a successful kill here rather to push the enemies to back is very low because your laner who does the most damage here is Tristana. While you have your Lux who is the support is not going to do as much damage as Tristana. Tristana needs to back off anyway. If she has to stay any longer here she is going to die and that puts your team as a disadvantage. I will just watch out the, the pace of it. You ended up trying to get this kill or rather trying to get this gank off at around hold on a moment around minute 
five, around time 5.50 around there, you ended up trying to path down to get this kill. I mentioned in this macro tip number 8 that it was at 5.40 you went to get this gank off and you ended getting the gank off at time 6.40, which is, means that you wasted almost a whole minute just pathing down here trying to get a kill off or a successful gank, but nothing is going to come out of it because of the fact that the laners were so pushed up and there's no way for you to get onto them. You're standing in this bush trying to get wait for Zach to re-engage. However, it's an okay idea to wait for him to re-engage to see if you will engage onto Tristana. But if he does re-engage, it is likely that you will still not be able to get a kill because your damage is not high enough in order to kill either Zach or Thrash. Zach and Thrash are both very tanky champions. And even if Lux and you survive and Tristana dies, you're losing. Uh, Lena, not only the fact that you're losing a Lena, but you're also not going to be able to do enough damage, most likely, in order to kill either Zack or Thresh. Not only this, what you should have done instead is you should have walked back and go to clear your golems, which you have yet to clear, and you should have pinged back your Lenas so that they can avoid being killed from by Zack. This is all valid information you need to take into account, and I have mentioned it in the macro tip number 8. I will go into further detail of the macro tip when this time period of 6.40 approaches. Now let's watch this out. As you can see, Katarina roams down and ends up getting a kill onto your Lux. Not only this, but she also ends up getting a kill onto your Tristana. She got a double kill and therefore she is snowballed very hard here. You do never want a team that is a late game team composition to ever snowball, particularly a team like this, into the early game. Because if they are able to snowball in the early game, a team that has a very good late game composition, which I mentioned previously, will be able to dominate you into the late game even harder than they already would be able to. So, what you should have done is you should have pinged back your laners, immediately pinged back the river, particularly because you know a Katarina can roam down, you even have Zach who could have killed them either way. And then you should have went back to farm your jungle. This applies also to what I you mentioned previously about how you're not being able to keep up on CS. Reason why is because you are assisting lanes when it is unnecessary to assist the lane. Like in this situation, you're not going to be able to get a kill off. The only reason, or rather the only way you'll get a kill off is if the enemy does a very, a very unthoughtful play. Which I believe happened already where you got a kill onto Katarina. This is not going to happen in all games where you got to kill on Katarina this easily because she suicides into the tower. This is not going to always happen. This is what I call as a variable, a variable kill, meaning that it's not going to happen in all games. This is just the enemy making a very big mistake. So what I mentioned it here, <coughs> sorry, it says, never waste time going to a lane where a successful gank being accomplished is impossible. Efficiency is key and analyzing when a gank can work is very important. Thinking of minion wave positions, and when you realize the Pacific lane is ungankable, go back to farm your jungle. The gank bottom lane is never going to work, which is what I have stated already. This is a major mistake. You wasted a whole minute of efficiency from 540 to 640, and the only reason you got a kill was because of a variable mistake made by the enemy, which will not happen in future games. Never rely on kills being handed to you by the enemy. This is unreliable. This is exactly what I mentioned. You never want to rely on a gank like this ever working because this is most likely not going to work in future games. <clears throat> I will now continue the replay. You end up waiting here to catch the minion wave, which is fine because you want to gain the experience that would be lost otherwise if you weren't here. And you're getting a gold lead too by clearing the minions. This is all fine. What you're going to end up doing now is you're going to try and clear your red buff. <clears throat> clearing your red buff, or rather clearing, yeah, clearing your red buff is fine. However, you should have cleared your golems before you cleared your red buff. You have yet to clear your golems for the game. And I don't believe you ever clear them in the early stages of the game. You need to clear all your camps so they'll be up at particular times and you'll be able to stock up on your CS, which you have already talked about, so you have a problem with. <clears throat> so you should have cleared your golems. After you clear the golems, then you could have cleared your red buff. 
I mentioned it in macro tip number nine. Always clear your camps in your initial clears, clears one and two, as well as always clear your camps sequentially without putting one camp as a higher priority than the other. As if you do this, you are denying yourself both experience and goals. I previously mentioned this macro tip, however, not in as much detail as <clears throat> I mentioned this time. Exhibit at 8.55, which, I, which is at, um, let me see, I'll just skip to the time. Yes, you're clearing your blue buff. However, when you're walking towards your blue buff, you end up missing clearing your wolves, I believe. <clears throat> I'll just play it out. So you're walking upwards towards your blue side, which is fine because you already cleared your, <clears throat> your red buff and your raptors. Though you should have cleared your golems, which I don't believe you have done in this particular instance. But you end up passing your wolves, which is still up because you never cleared it. And instead you end up clearing your blue buff. Instead of doing this, you should have cleared your wolves, then you cleared your blue buff. By doing this, you'll be able to clear all your camps and you're putting yourself at a greater experience and gold lead. This relates back to the problem you have mentioned. So never farm in an efficient direction as shown at the time where you never clear your golems. In fact, you haven't cleared them for the entire game. This is why you keep complaining about the CS being low. You're looking for way too many ganks or providing assistance to your team when the ability to help is putting you behind rather than putting you ahead. Experience gain is way more important than goal gain. And this experience is very high to get from jungle camps over the unreliable kills. Jungle minions equal to reliable experience gain, while kills are unreliable in comparison. You have lost so much time doing this mentioned, and I even see that you end up um, what I call, and what league league um, players call BMing. I'll just play it to show you. So you end up walking towards mid lane, and. There's no way for you to assist Talon here. This is what I mean by you're wasting time by trying to assist the laner. Where there's no way for you to assist the laner in the first place. <clears throat> right, you walk to the lane again, which is still wasting time because it's very unlikely you will get a kill here. You almost kill Katarina. So you don't end up killing us, you're just wasting time. You end up spamming your emote for no reason. This is just wasting time. And you end up taking talent CS, which is also not a beneficial thing for your team. Because you're putting him at a gold and experience disadvantage. So you want to minimize BMing in ranked. In my, in my opinion, this is just wasting time in the game. And it is throwing off your lead. And you're not... You're not thinking seriously about the game. You've lost so much of this I mentioned, inclusive of BMing, which emotes, which is the opposite of beneficial for you in a ranked game. You should keep this for normals. Ranked is a serious environment for improving only. So you need to you need to stop doing this and you need to clear your camps efficiently in order to keep your experience slash goals gain at a beneficial level. If you're wondering why I underlined these two macro tips, macro tip number eight and nine, the reason why I underline these two macro tips is because these two, mac these two macro tips are probably the most important macro tips out of all the macro tips in these 20. And also macro tip number 14. The reason why these macro tips are so important is because not wasting time in the jungle is very important, which is mentioned here. Never waste time going to a lane where a gank is possible, where a gank isn't possible. So you always want to be efficient as a jungler. In addition to this, the same thing applies to always clear your camps in a sequential order so you're not denying yourself experience or a goal's lead. So this is all about efficiency in the jungle and putting yourself at as big of an advantage as you possibly can. So these are the most important things you should be focusing on and improving. However, all the macro tips on a whole, the 20 macro tips are important and you should incorporate every macro tip into each game. This is the reason why I have wrote them all out into this Word document. Okay, I will now continue the replay.
I'm going to skip uh, this time. You end up seeing that you can get a successful gank on Tanassus, which is fine. And I believe you do end up getting a kill on Tanassus. Yes, you end up getting a kill on Tanassus. This is perfectly fine. And what I mentioned previously about assisting the laners into pushing their lane, you do it in this instance, even though you didn't do it in the other case. This is perfectly fine. This is what I wanted you to do in the Talon lane. And then you end up seeing if you can get some damage onto the tower, which is perfectly fine also. In this instance, you knew that Narcissus' teleport was down because you know this information. You could easily attack the tower. And you can possibly even take the tower, which you do do in this situation. Not only this, but you are aware that Zack is bottom lane, which you can see on the minimap. And so you know that Zack cannot come to contest this particular tower and stop you from taking it. So you do end up taking the tower. This is this is perfect what you should be doing in each lane. You want to snowball your lead as much as you possibly can. And by snowballing your lead, you're able to clear as much objectives as possible and propel your lead forward and win the game at an earlier phase than the enemies wanted to end the game. So after you're done pushing anyway, which is fine, this is also fine, so we'll crash into a Nasus tower and make it more difficult for him to farm, you end up trying to take Zack's jungle. This is perfectly fine. By taking Zack's jungle, you are putting him at a disadvantage. Not only this, but you are at a much larger lead than Zack is, based on your experience and your goals. I'm pretty sure I can't see it by based on your scoreboard, because it is not up on this replay. However, you are definitely at an advantage over Zack. And so he has no ability to contest you over these camps if you're in his jungle. Again, you end up doing a similar thing which you do on your side of the jungle. You skip golems for some reason. What you should be doing is you should take all the camps in that side of the jungle. Because you know that Zack was bought. There's no way for him to even get to this side of the map quick enough for, to contest you. So you should have took his golems firstly. So you will put yourself at a larger lead than you would do if you did not take the golems. And so you want to take the golems. After you take the golems, then you can take the red like you're doing here. Taking the red is perfect, but you should have taken the golems first, which is something you need to consider. Always clear the camps that you can in when you are doing an invade. You end up going to check his raptors after, which is also fine. It's not up. But something you could have also done is you could have placed a ward into this bush here. Or you could have placed a ward anywhere, but particularly in a bush would be beneficial. So you'll be able to see more vision than strictly in one area. And so if you place a ward here, you will know when Zack reapproaches in his jungle on this side of the map. And so you'll be able to know where he's going next simply by his character movements when you see him on the ward. And so this is very important information knowing where the enemy jungle is going to go next. And so you, if you have a ward up, I'm not sure if you had a ward up in this situation, but if you did, you should have placed a ward into that bush or anywhere around the map in this area of his jungle in order to know where he's going to move next. This is this was an okay move though that you went to his jungle to take his camps. However, you could have executed it a lot better than you did. So it's mentioned here. Whenever you know the location of the enemy jungle, where in this situation you knew he was bot side, and you're on the opposite side of the map having an easy access to the jungle. Always take the advantage and clear out their respective jungle side since they are in no way to contest you as this will deplete your experience as well as goal gain. <clears throat> you should have cleared golems first which I mentioned here and I've said previously. Then take on red buff. Chances are Zack will not be able to contest you since you have a lead kill wise and experience wise which I've mentioned already. I've also mentioned macro tip number 11. Always drop a ward into the enemy jungle when you are invading so that you know the enemy jungler's path, following them being seen on the map as this gives your team a huge advantage. It's not only giving your, yourself an advantage because you know where he is and you could possibly counter gank and rather counter jungle another side of his map or you could even counter gank him or take an objective where he's not on that area of the map and so you have an advantage to take that, that objective without him contesting it. So, but it also helps your team. So it's valid to place wards if you have a ward up into the enemy jungle. You should do this for all games, not only this particular game. I'll now continue watching the replay. In this instance, you end up pushing the wave into the tower. This is a very good move that you were able to push this wave into the tower. The reason for this is because they have a large minion ally wave coming in order 
to reach to crash into this tower. If you push the wave in, it will easily crash into the tower, and because Katarina isn't in the lane yet, she is going to be denied a large amount of experience and gold if she doesn't approach this tower in time when you push the wave into it. So the tower will be able to kill the minions whenever she's de being denied gold and also experience. Experience is very important, and by denying the enemy this, she is being put at a disadvantage. So it is good that you roamed into mid lane in order to push the wave in. This is a very good move. The only instance is this when I would say that you should take the uh, mid laner CS, which you mentioned that the laners complain when you take their CS. It is good in this situation to take the CS and push it into the, the enemy tower, so deny the enemy mid laner goals and experience. However, if it was not a large minion wave approaching, and let's say there was the minions were much closer to your tower and they're going to take a long time to reach the enemy tower, then you should not have made this move that you did. However, in this situation, it's fine. You should do this to all lanes when you realize that it's going to be able to push up into the enemy tower quickly. As in this case, uh, mention it in your positives. Your ability to tier one that you can get a kill onto an enemy tower after securing a kill is extremely good. This is what I mentioned previously when you got the kill onto Nasus and then you were able to take the tower. And this must be applied to all lanes. Just because I'm mentioning it as a positive, something you have done correctly, you need to apply this to each game and you shouldn't strictly do it for this game and not do it for the next game. You need to be consistent in your play. So after obtaining a kill, if possible, especially when your team has the weaker late game, you need to do this. Next, I said knowing to push in a wave when it's close to crashing into the enemy tower, especially when there's a big ally minion wave, is very good as this denies the enemy large amounts of gold or experience. I will now go on to the next macro tip, which is macro tip number 12. You have been on the map for an extended period of time, which I haven't shown. However, I watched the replay and saw that you were on the map for a very long time and even counter jungles and you got a kill. So you most likely have much more than 1.5k gold at this point in the game. You never want to be sitting on such a large amount of gold, like 1,500 gold. The reason for this is because you're putting yourself at an item power spike diminishing, meaning that you will be at a decreased amount of items you could have had if you were to back at a faster time. So you want to back as soon as you're done pushing in the wave, which you have done here. I believe you do not end up backing, you go back into your jungle to try and take more farm. But you're putting yourself at a disadvantage by doing this because you're not going to spend your gold which you need to spend when you're sitting on such a large amount. I mentioned it here, always back when you have at a maximum of 1.5k gold. As if you stay on the map for such an extended period of time, you're not only denying yourself of item power spikes, but also not only what I mentioned, but also throwing off your camp clearing sequence. What I mean by this is you're clearing your raptors here however you end up not even clearing your raptors your golems still if you had backed you'll most likely be you most likely have the motive to come back bot side given that you still have your raptor camp up and because you have this motive knowing that one of your camps additionally are up you'll probably come back here and then take your golems and if your red buff is up then you could have also taken your red you want to take all this information into account as i mentioned in macro tip number 12. I'll now go on to the next macro tip. This is macro tip number 13. I'll just play all the replay. In this particular instance, Zack was too far away from you in order for you to make use of your red smite. However, not only in this situation, but in all games, you should be applying this principle, which is in macro tip number 13. You should always use a red smite into an enemy before you end up damaging them. The reason for this is when you red smite an enemy, you are applying both a burn onto the enemy, and in addition to this, your auto attacks onto the enemy will do true damage apart from normal damage and so be able to penetrate their armor so it's better to red smite them before you end up damaging them so this is the first thing you want to do when you encounter an enemy if you have your red smite up is to smite them which is your warrior enchantment and then you'll get a maximum damage onto the enemy champion 
I'll now go into the 40 macro tip, which is also underlined, meaning that this macro tip is a very important one. Now let's continue on the replay analysis. Before I get into macro tip number 14, I want to discuss this team fight. You realize that your team is at an advantage based on health and based on the enemies. Enemies aren't reaching the point of being late game heavy damage or rather late game heavy tankiness and being able to team fight very well. And so you have the advantage here to be able to initiate a team fight. Not only this, but your laners as well as yourself are level 8 while the enemies are level 7. You also want to look at that experience, experience based on levels. You have the advantage because you have a level 9, a level 8, and also Talon, who is also level 8, I believe, is here. And so you all will win this fight simply based on experience and level gains. Two level 9s and a level 8. So you have the advantage here based on levels. So you also want to look at the enemy, enemy's level, and then you'll be able to know if you have the advantage or not. You should take this information to account. I mentioned it at your positives where it says your decision-making as regards winning a team fight is good, which is at 1250, and conscious thought must be gone into the winning of each fight rather than diving in without thinking. You do it in this situation, you probably didn't realize that the enemies were a lower level than your laners. However, you need to apply this information of levels into each game where your team has a higher level than the enemy's team. So you end up taking Dragon, this is perfectly fine. I'll just fast forward a bit. <clears throat> I'm just trying to find my market tip number 14 is seen. I believe it is when you go to mid lane to try and get a kill onto Katarina. <clears throat> yes, you end up parting upwards to try and get a kill onto Katarina. This applies not to the macro side as much as it applies to the micro side. I still included it in the macro tip, so this is more than a, more of a micro tip than a macro tip. So what I say is you should be patient with the use of your dash abilities in your champion's kit, considering all enemy escape abilities for every champion prior to using the gap close. I emphasize every and all simply be based on the fact that you shouldn't apply it only to Katarina. Many champions have escape abilities, and so you should apply this to all champions. You can see it right here. You dash onto Katarina. Because you have used your dash, you have no way to get back onto Katarina. <clears throat> you have used your dash already, and because of this, you can't get back onto Katarina to deal more damage onto her. If you had saved your dash ability, waiting to predict when she is going to dash, because she is most likely going to escape, because in the fact that she is under the enemy tower and you are trying to do damage onto her, she is 100% going to escape using one of her damage, her escape abilities. And because of the fact that she escapes and you use your gap close already, not accounting for the fact that she could have used her escape, you instead end up not getting the kill. However, if you had saved your escape, I mean your gap close ability, which means to close the distance between you and the enemy, you would have been able to get that kill. After she dashed away, then you could have dashed onto her and then got the kill in most situations. So you should have waited on Katrina to dash away prior to using your gap close onto her. This would have not only secured this kill, but many similar kills against Katarina. Not only Katarina, but all champions who have escape mechanisms on a whole. I'll now play it out to the 15th macro tip. And I've underlined this macro tip simply because this is extremely important for <clears throat> champions that have gap closes like Xin Zhao. In the 15 macro tip, I mentioned that you could have simply walked up to this tower, which I cannot see at the moment. I'll just, I'll just rewind it a little bit. 
you end up taking your raptors, which is fine. You still have to take your golems, which is what I mentioned previously. You need to work on that. You end up going to mid lane. <coughs> and as you can see here, the tower is literally on like two auto attacks. If even as much as two auto attacks, it can be just one auto attack. When you see a tower on such low HP, you can simply just walk up to it and auto attack it twice. The enemies can't retaliate to that. Just auto attack it twice and then you could possibly initiate a team fight. Because the tower is doing less damage to you once it's killed. So you could have you could have taken this tower and then you could have initiated a team fight. Given that your team was at an advantage. In this situation, the team is at an advantage if Talon is to proceed. And so you could have taken the tower and then initiated a possible successful fight. If a tower is extremely low on HP, simply walk up to the tower and kill it. Then you can safely initiate a fight, initiate a fight if there's advantages for you in terms of numbers. I mentioned a tower literally has 10 HP, but you refuse to walk up and take it. You need to take down your respect for the enemy champions. What I mean by respect is this isn't a very high elo game where the enemies are going to retaliate. This might not even be possible in a very high elo game where the enemies can retaliate to you doing two auto attacks until you tower or simply one. They will not take advantage of you doing this. I'll now go on to the 16th macro tip, which can be seen at timestamp 16, as I mentioned here. I'll just play it all from this time. So the enemy team initiates a team fight. You end up like, damaging Thresh. I'm not sure if you use your gap close, but you end up damaging Thresh, which is a frontline champion. And he is the only one doing the damage in the team fight <clears throat> to any extent. He's a support. Even if this was a tank like Zack, it is not beneficial to do damage to the front line. You're playing an engaged champion. And this is an engaged champion like a bruiser such as Zinzao is a champion. You want to go onto the back line and damage the back line laners or rather the carries. These are in this particular game Katarina and Jinx. You wanted to dash onto the back line and then activate the ult so they'll do less damage when they are further away from you and auto attacking from a distance and then you could have engaged to kill possibly Katarina or Jinx. You never want to damage the front line. The front line Thresh almost dies, however he escapes and not only this, your team is not put at a disadvantage because of the fact that you did not end up engaging onto the carries. If you eliminate the carries, your team will be at an advantage where they are taking less damage due to the fact the majority of the damage is coming from Katarina and Jinx. So you always want to take this into account when you're playing an engaged champion. Or bruiser. I mentioned it here, always dive into the back line when you're playing an engaged champion rather than attacking the front line. In this instance, this is Thresh. You would have easily won this team fight had you had went onto the enemy back line. And not only this, but you could have secured the enemy in a mid turret, if not more than that, given enemy death timers, if you were to have killed the back line and won the team fight on a whole. This could have Turn the tides of the entire game given that you engage on the back line instead of taking your damage and your cooldowns onto the front line thresh. And so you could have won the team fight for your team and possibly gotten a large amount of towers, even the inner mid turrets. This game is a ticking time bomb, I mentioned here. The longer you leave it to go on, the lesser your chances of winning the game because this is due to the fact that the enemy has a better scaling team composition that is Katarina mostly and Zack. I've already discussed this in the analysis of the game prior to getting into it. You need to analyze your win conditions. You don't want this game to go on to an extent of 30 to 40 minutes or even longer than that, as at that time, your team is going to be weaker in a team composition, team fight position than the enemy team. So you always want to consider this and you want to snowball your lead as best as you possibly can. This could have been done by doing what is mentioned in market tip number 16. I'll now continue the replay until I can talk about the 17th macro tip. Hold on a moment. I believe I mentioned the time. Uh, this is at 17.50. So I'll just let it play out until it reaches that timestamp. So 
So you go mid to try and help your laners defend the turret. <clears throat> and you stay around the area instead of going to farm your camps. Because you're staying around the area here, there's no reason for you to stay to try and defend this tower. Reason for this is because there is only, I think, only Nasus, only three laners in mid lane. And you have two champions who has extremely high wave player. The enemy team has Katarina and Katarina Thresh and Katarina Thresh and Nasus, who are all melee champions and cannot clear the minions near as easily as your laners, Lux and Talon can. Lux and Talon have enough wave player, which is the ability to clear the minions, then you need to be there. There's no reason for you to be in mid lane trying to defend this tower because your laners have enough wave player. The only situation I would say you need to be in mid lane is if the enemy team had more champions who maybe they had very good wave player. Or even if they were outnumbered your laners by a large amount. Let's say like four of the enemy champions are here and you only have two of your laners. Maybe in that situation, then you should have came to help your mid laners or rather the team in mid to assist in defending this tower. You're wasting a significant amount of time by just walking around in mid doing absolutely nothing. When there are no minions to farm, or rather, nothing to help your team not get damage taken onto the tower. Instead, what you and you're waiting here again, there's no chance for you to get a kill onto here. You have no engaged champions. The only engaged champion here is Lux, who can snare, but it is unreliable that you can get a kill there. So you're, that's all wasting time. What you could have done instead is you could have gone into your jungle and taken more camps. This also relates to your problem with CS. Where you see you are behind on CS. You could have just went into your jungle instead of just waiting around in the lane when nothing is going to happen. Because your team has wave player. And you could have went into your jungle and gained a better experience or goals lead. Which is what I mentioned here. Never spend excessive amounts of time trying to help your team defend an objective. Go into your jungle and power farm. Which means to farm to a large extent in order to get an experience or goals lead. Rather than continuously denying yourself of this lead. Standing in a lane doing nothing to help your team or yourself. This is at this time, Sam. This is another reason why you say you're behind on CS, as you're wasting way too much time. Talon or Lux is enough wave player to prevent the tower being taken. The only situation where you should assist in defending a tower is if your team is outnumbered in terms of wave player ability. I will now look into the last three macro tips, and then this concludes all the information I want to relate to you. And by using all this information I've mentioned, you should significantly improve your play. And this is a large amount of information. I know it will take a long time to implement all of it. However, if you take the time, you can implement each of these macro tips slowly into each game. Don't try to implement all of the macro tips in one go. You should take your time, apply maybe like three macro tips per every five games, then up the next three and so on until you improve all that I have mentioned, and then you would significantly see yourself climbing gradually over a period of time, and you'd easily get your goal of the Pacific tier or rank. So I'll now continue, continue the replay in order to allocate the 18, 19, and 20 macro tip. At this timestamp, you can see that you'll end up taking the mid tower and the next mid tower. Then I believe you also take the inhibitor. This is all perfectly fine. However, what I mentioned in the 18th macro tip is you should, you should, following taking a tower, look for the next objective on the map. And given that it is a tower, push up the wave so that the minions crash into the enemy tower so that your team applies pressure to those specific lanes. The game is all about pressure across the map. You need to apply pressure to all lanes so they are forced to farm the lanes or to push up the minions and they have less access to try and initiate a fight due to the fact that they need to farm the lanes. You must always look for the ben next beneficial move to make. Uh, if you take a tower, you shouldn't just wait there and be like, um, just stand around doing nothing or just walking into the enemy jungle. You need to think to yourself, what objective can I take next? So this is what you should have done in this particular situation. What you should have done is you should have went to top and pushed in the wave so that it crashes into the top tower or you could have went bot and crashed it into the bot tower you could have also pinged your laners to, on the tower so ping the enemy tower on top or bottom in order to assist help get team your team to assist you in pushing any minion waves you might not be able to take the tower specifically however you are increasing the pressure onto the enemy and can therefore eventually take the tower so this is what i mentioned in macro tip number 18. I'll now discuss macro tip number 19, which happens just after this. You end up making a barren call. 
but this barn call is not a good barn call. This is probably one of the biggest mistakes, or rather the one of the bigger of the few that you make in this game. I should have highlighted this by an underline. In this particular instance, you make a barn call. The reason why this is not a good barn call is because you see the enemies now coming up. Their death time was just finished. And therefore, they possibly know that you are heading towards Baron. And therefore, they are going to try and steal Baron. Not only this, but they also have a control ward on Baron. And because of the fact that they are up, they are going to try and secure the Baron. And therefore, you will be at a huge disadvantage if they end up taking this. If they are to take this Baron, it is most likely that they can simply group after they take Baron and end the game. Because your team is at a large disadvantage due to the fact that their team is a late game team composition, they can win fights more easily and if they have Baron buff, this even helps them even much more than they already had help based on the nature of the team composition. And so by you taking a chance or risk to get Baron here when the enemies are up, this is not a good Baron call. You should only make Baron calls when the Baron pit is clear of vision or one enemy is not, not alive or more than one enemy is not alive, or even the jungler is not alive to try and smite steal the Baron. Or the area is sweeped previously and they have no idea that you are taking it. So this is could this could have been a huge mistake and costed you the game before it even reached the point of ending. So never make a Baron call where the enemy team is just about to come up and your team lacks the damage to clear it. This is another thing. Your team <clears throat> composition is okay, but because of the fact that your stana is on the other side of the map. For some reason, she is not applying the damage that Tristana has. Tristana has a large amount of sustained damage and so she would have helped you all take this Baron a lot quicker. Because you don't have her, you should immediately um, dis taking this Baron. You should immediately come away from the Baron and trying to think of what is the next best decision, like I mentioned in Macro Tip number 18, by pushing up minion waves. This is not a good Baron call, I cannot stress it enough. This score was extremely risky and could have possibly threw away the entire lead your team had. You had a major lead in this game based on your snowball. Though you could have snowballed it harder, it still snowballed. And so by you taking this risk of taking Barney enemies, you could have taken it. And therefore you would have put at a disadvantage and possibly lost the game immediately. I'll now look at the last macro tip which happens at the end of the game. This last macro tip, macro tip number 20, isn't as important as the others. However, it is still something to consider. Not only that happened in this particular replay... Of a, in all particular in all games it could not be the same as in this situation which I'll pull up now however you need to always consider this information you will end up sieging down mid which is fine and you're trying to take the inhibitor though it is quite risky to take this inhibitor and what you should have done instead is you should have pinged back your team and warn them to not engage a fight because you are outnumbered. You're outnumbered because your top laner, or rather your entire team has went top, and they are surrounded by the enemies. And so you needed to back off here immediately and paint your laners not to fight and just walk back. You shouldn't be trying to initiate any fight here because your team is at a huge disadvantage now due to the fact not only because of the, in the late game phase of the game and the enemy team has a better team composition, but also because of the fact that your team was surrounded and you probably don't know where all the enemies are. So this is a very risky play. You ended up killing Zack, which is fine. However, if you get collapsed on by the enemy team, this will put your team at a major disadvantage. I believe it will happen soon. They don't have Zack, but they still have a good team fighting potential and the only way for you all to win a team fight is if you eliminate one of the carries which is either Jinx or Katarina. Instead of this happening, you end up you end up getting I think East if I recall. You see the fact that Nasus is quite huge at this point in the game due to his large amount of stacks and you also have Thresh and Katarina who is extremely fed at this point in the game. So you need to take this infinite account and ping your team back. This is very crucial to the game, and I believe after this, the enemy team ends up attempting to take Baron, and they might even secure it, which, as I mentioned previously with the Baron call at number, macro tip number 19, is they end up taking Baron, and they are a much bigger lead than they already had, based on the team fights alone. 
So they are even they are going to secure this baron and being able to put at a much larger lead. This is most of what I wanted to discuss in this replay analysis and this coaching session on a whole. However, I want to emphasize that you should always make sure your team does not overstay as you get putting yourself at a risk of dying. Once you get Zach, you should be careful, have the area watered around, and only initiate a team fight if you kill one of the carries. Just killing Zach is enough. You need to kill the carries who are doing any major amount of damage, which is Jinx and Katarina. Only in that instance can you team fight. Just killing one of the tanks is not beneficial to initiate a team fight. So never over so you need to apply this to every game. You need to apply all these magnet tips to every game. I kind of emphasized enough. And you need to fix your runes, your skill build, and your your runes, your skill build, and your item build. And by following all these macro tips I mentioned and applying it to every single game, you will significantly improve your play and climb the ranked ladder in the new season. Thank you for listening. I hope this solves all your problems and not only solves your problems, but also gives you a much larger depth and inlook into the game and improves your play for the new season in the future. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.